got to solve this problem. We need everybody to come with us. And if we don't go together, we're doomed to fail. And it's time for us to win this war. All these combinations are great, but it's so we put this work into action. you sit here. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you, Helen, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophia, and it is so wonderful to be with you all today. When I got the email that I had the opportunity to host this incredible fireside chat with Jane and Jerome, I jumped at the opportunity because I know how important this conversation is. Uh, fossil fuels are the primary cause of climate change, yet they have barely been mentioned in international agreements over the past 30 years. As activists for the protection of the Earth and all of its inhabitants from global warming, it is our job to push this cause no matter how sensitive. And on this note, I'm delighted to have Jane and Jerome join me on this stage to explore more about what we can do to push as hard as possible for a global fossil fuel phase out. Uh, and so for our opening question, I think it's important to note this is one of few intergenerational conversations happening at Climate Week, but it's not the first time that you two have spoken side by side uh, on the past, present, and the future of climate activism. We've made progress as a climate collective, but emissions are still rapidly rising, and we've once again seen the devastation that the climate catastrophe has wrecked on Hawaii, Canada, Turkey, and Chile, to name a few nations. So what can we do as a society to help change the trajectory that we are currently on? Jane, I'd love to start with you. What can we do? OK. First of all, can we just give ourselves a huge applause? Because four years ago, three years ago, nobody talked about fossil fuels. This is a major move forward. <laughs> Very important. Big thing. OK. Private money, public money. We have to make sure that as individuals we are not invested in fossil fuels, that our cities, our towns, our churches, our unions are not invested in fossil fuel. Divest, number one. Number two, there's the public money. We have to get, we have to end the subsidies that we taxpayers give to fossil fuel companies, right? <laughs> We need $20 billion every year to go to expand the, when you plug in EVs. You know, we, need, we need to expand the possibilities for green, you know, the green future, and we need that money. We can't be giving it to people that make billions of profits every year and are killing us. And Jerome, what do you think? What do you think as a society, especially as a young You should person, talk louder. <laughs> I'm going to project now. Yeah. Jerome, what do you think that we as a society, especially from the perspective of a, a young person, what can we do to change the trajectory that we are currently on? I think the biggest issue coming into this next decade is for us to really tackle greenwashing. When anyone goes to a store or operates in society, they're there's a lot of question marks because they're wondering what is actually ethical, what is actually sustainable because these terms aren't defined. And I think that's the first step is creating a, a framework in which they have parameters backing these terms which are used so often and so frivolously. I think the next step is, is, is educating young people. Like my generation, we, we grew up understanding that the climate crisis is a huge ticking time bomb which is looming over our mind every time we wake up, every time we go to school, every time we go home, we see the climate crisis knocking at our front door. If we look at the US today, one third of Americans have been directly impacted by the climate crisis. This isn't an issue about is climate change real or not. It's not an issue about will we have the time to, to, to stop the climate crisis. It's an issue of will we have the moral clarity and ambition to be able to stop the climate crisis. Everyone in this room has the power if we all came together to stop the climate crisis. And that's what we need to do, is use that moral clarity, use that courage to create change.
While the fossil fuel phase out will not gain traction without political allies, and the Jane Fonda Climate Pact has played a huge role in championing and providing critical support to ch climate champions who are running for office at all levels of government. So Jane, I'd love to hear from you, how has the political landscape changed and how should it change as we head towards our hottest year on record? Uh, well, first, first of all, 70% of America, North Americans are concerned or alarmed about the climate crisis. That wasn't true three or four years ago. So this is the result of especially young people protesting, the huge protests in 2019 and onward. I mean, good turnout today, too, with a lot of, maybe it was yesterday. Yeah, I wasn't here. Should have been. Anyway, um, so there's been a big move in terms of public opinion. And you know, a lot of, 30% of North Americans say they would engage in civil disobedience if somebody asked them that they trusted. So one of the things that we really, really need to think about is there's a great unasked out there, probably in every country, certainly in North America, and we have to ask them to, to go beyond concern into action. Um, okay, the question was what? The, the, how has the political landscape change and how should it continue right. to change? Well, one thing is really clear. It's too late for incrementalism, right? And anybody that tells you, well, moderation, we have to be moderate, they're crazy. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to them. They're wrong. We have very little time left. This is an all hands on deck moment. So that's another thing. Too late for politeness. We have to say it like it is. We have to stand up. We have to be brave. I am so grateful that I have this climate pack now because I travel around and, and go into communities in support of the candidates, the climate champions that we endorse, mostly women. <laughs> mostly women of color. And they are so brave, I can't tell you. They are so brave and so smart and so strategic. You know, like you talk about it differently in an oil producing state like New Mexico or California or Texas than you do somewhere. They know how to thread the needle with tremendous strategies. So I just want to tell you, all the hope you need is out there Maybe they're not supported by the DCCC, but boy, are they good. And with a little more support, we can put climate champions over the, over the top. And we can replace the oily Democrats. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Too many people that we elect to office are taking money from, from the fossil fuel industry. So when we go to vote everywhere in the world, we have to be sure, and you can find out whether the person we're considering voting for takes money from the fossil fuel industry. Because if they do, then they're not gonna let good policies come by. And so many, there've been good policies. Build Back Better, forget IRA. The Build Back Better was the bill that we needed. And it was oily Democrats that stopped it. We have to replace them. If you can't change the people, change the people. <laughs> And Jerome, on, on that topic, the nexus of racial inequality and climate change has often been a challenging subject to broach. And as the youngest member of President Biden's White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and a man of color, who do we need to hold accountable for the protection of marginalized communities who are bearing the brunt of environmental injustice? That's a really good question. I, I think a lot of times when we talk about the climate crisis, we think of it as a issue that is outside the bounds of human rights, and they don't think about the climate crisis as something that impacts families and impacts communities. But when we think about the climate crisis, it impacts communities totally different and totally differently. And I think one example of that is that 78% of African Americans live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. And black people only make up 14% of the population. That's environmental racism. Because the strategic placement of fossil fuels in black communities creates a higher risk, pre-existing conditions, so that when a natural disaster hits, it's not equal. Racial injustice is a precondition for the climate crisis. And when we think about solutions to it, 
it's oftentimes not just on the federal level, but the state level. For so long in Louisiana, there have been communities for 70 years who have been ignored on their policy asks. They've testified, they've done everything they can. And until a few years ago, now they're being heard. But not all of them are being heard, only a few of them. I think that's what has to change, is for us to really center the communities that are at the front lines of the climate crisis, center their stories, center their, their rights, and think about how are we as, as, as citizens living in a world where we have abundance, we have so much opportunity, but so many communities are left out. That's the way in which our society operates wrongly. It's, it's how are we thinking about ways in which we cannot just change the margins, but change the root issue. And that comes from, on the local level, voting people out that are being racist. Because even the WeJack Council we've been working over the past three years, and a lot of the money that we've been giving to black and brown communities have met racist local officials who have denied money to those communities. Mm. And it is the voters, it is the young people, it is the marginalized communities who are rising up and saying enough is enough. And we will vote you out. That's what we need to continue to do. And a new report from Action Aid released on September 4th found that since the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, banks have provided some $3.2 trillion to the fossil fuel industry to expand operations. And essentially, the causes that are fueling the climate crisis are receiving 20 times more financing than the solutions. So what can we as activists do to stop fossil fuel financing in its tracks? Jane, I'd love to start with you. I already answered it. <laughs> we have to, Bill McKibben launched, where he was one of the people that launched the, uh, the divestiture, you know, get the money out of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, we cut up our Chase. Chase is one of the big banks that's really invested in fossil fuels, by the way. So you take your Chase card and you cut it. <laughs> <laughs> and get someone to film you and then put it on your social, social media. I now bank at Amalgamated. It's a union bank. It doesn't take any money. Yeah. Find a bank like that or come to a Amalgamated. <laughs> no, really, we have to be very intentional. This is, we've been lied to for 40 years about what's happening. They knew, Exxon knew 40 years ago, and they didn't tell the truth, and that's why we have a crisis right now. Incrementalism would have been great back then would have been much easier to phase out of the thing that really created our society. It's the bedrock of our society, and now we have to let it go. It's complicated. But yeah, we have to force the banks by taking our money out of the banks that invest in fossil fuels. Don't marry anybody that's invested in <laughs> But when you vote, go to the polls with climate in your heart. All those other issues that we care about won't matter if we don't have a livable planet. I completely agree. And there are many concerned citizens around the globe, including here today, who are actively turning their climate anxiety into action and using rallies on the ground the way you have been for decades, Jane, and using the power and persuasion of social media and like you, Jerome, now advising the highest levels of our government on the way forward. So what does the future of climate activism look like to you and how can we recruit more people to join this movement? Jerome. I think seeing what happened yesterday and, and seeing that 75,000 people mobilized in the streets and thanks to organizer Kat who's here who did a lot of work and just want to give her a round of applause. <laughs> And I think more of action like that is what's, what's really going to continue to happen. Young people will not go back to the status quo of injustice, complicity, and overconsumption. And we'll, we'll continue to see that change will happen whether we like it or not, just like Greta Thunberg said. And I think it, it's, it's whether corporations want to be a part of that change or if they want to be a part of the past. That, that's really what's going to happen because young people look at a company and they vote, and then when they go and buy something, they say, are they actually in line with my ethics? Are they actually in line with my morals? And if they aren't, they won't buy from them. So it's, it's, it's that simple. It's the, the reach of the environmental movement is for us to continue to grow, continue to vote, continue to create a society which is environmentally just. Can I add another half of that? Absolutely. As the previous moderator said, it takes two. You know, there's the, there's the, I don't know, I never know which is supply and demand, but the sustainable green stuff, and then there's the fossil fuels, and you've got to go after, after both. So unprecedented numbers in the streets, like we did during, 
none of you were alive then. I was almost <laughs> alive. During the Depression, tens of thousands of people in the streets demanding that Roosevelt do certain things. And they met with him. And he said, I agree with you. Now go out and make me do it. Mm. We have to go out and make them do it in unprecedented numbers, prepared to nonviolently engage in direct action, civil disobedience, risk getting arrested, put our bodies on the line. But then inside the walls of power, whether it's in the federal government or state or local, all the way down ballot, we have to elect people who will pay attention to those people in the streets, who are not bought off by corporations, who will serve people and not money once they're elected. And we're the ones that vote. So the, you know, we only have a couple more elections before the science tells us that it may be too hot to do anything about it and that it's beyond our control. So these elections that are coming up, Vote with climate in your heart. Vote for climate champions up and down the ballot. And let's let make Biden listen to us. Let us demand what we need. He said he was a climate president. Well, let's make him one. OK? Yeah. Next year. Next year, my organization, Wake Up, is mobilizing one million young people to turn out to vote in the 2024 election. Yes. We did it in 2020, and we elected climate champions. We're going to do it again for you next year. Yeah. So. It's really hard, though, because we have to criticize. We have to criticize. We have to make people earn our votes. But at the same time, then, all those wonderful young people, we have to say to them, but you know, when you vote, you're not getting married, right? It's not a date. It's pragmatic. So criticize and demand and rise up and then vote for somebody. It's better to push an ally than get stopped by a fascist. And that's the, that's the choice that we have now. Well, that's unfortunately all the time we have. I could talk, I could talk to you two for hours. <laughs> but I do want to thank you both, Jane and Jerome, for letting me share the stage with you and to Climate Group for the invitation to take part in Climate Week New York City this year. It's been my pleasure and an honor. And on that note, we will hand the floor back to Helen Clarkson.